Okay, we're going to make a start. Hello and welcome to this afternoon's event entitled Change Makers Talk, Decolonising the Curriculum, London Times Kent. And we have guests here this evening from the University of Kent. I'm going to hand over to my co-presenter. Cassia? Good. Apologies, I was muted. <laughs> um, so the event schedule is as follows. So LCC Changemakers will be presenting first, followed by the University of Kent Changemakers. After both pre presentations, there'll be a talk between LCC and Kent Changemakers with audience Q&As. This is an event being recorded for the LCC YouTube channel and word of warning, this talk will be centered around decolonization and anti-racism. Next slide, please. As part of this event, we have set up two modes of audience interaction, the Q&A chat tool and a Padlet page. To access, access the Padlet page, you can either scan the barcode or use the link presented on the slide. For those who might be new to Padlet, I've noted down with annotated diagram of how to navigate the site. Thank you. And you can also feel free to use the chat and the Q&A tools in the Zoom. Um, space. It'd be really interesting to know where those of you in the audience are geographically located uh, this afternoon, because I know for a fact that us panellists are quite dispersed geographically, me being in southeast of England on the Kent coast. Um, I think the furthest away on our panel might be in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, so it'd be great to know where people here are, are coming in from this afternoon. So we've got um, a few people on the panel to introduce. Cassia, did you want to introduce our, our side of the team? Yes, yeah, so the ones highlighted are today's um, speakers. <clears throat> Lucian and Mita are part of the progression and attainment team at LCC who manage the Changemakers team. And Rachel is situated in design school and I am part of the media school. Thank you. Just adding where I'm from to the chat. <laughs> And our very special guest from the University of Kent, who will be speaking shortly, um, are Dr. Dave S.P. Thomas, um, occupational therapist, a strategic inclusive leader, intellectual thought leader. Oh, now my, my screen is blocked with faces. Um, diversity and inclusion strategist with several publications on inclusive leadership, racial justice, equality and inclusion, educational psychology, occupational justice, and social justice. We have so much to learn from working with you, Dave. I'm so glad you could be here. You've also co-edited um, Diversity, Inclusion and Decolonization, a practical tool kit for research and scholarship. That's, is that forthcoming or already out there? Brilliant, Bristol University Press, look out for that. And the lead editor of Doing Equality, Equity and Diversity for Success in Higher Education from Palgrave. And the book that led us to this afternoon's event, which is called Decolonizing the University, a Kaleidoscope for Empowered Education, a 2020 publication um, that I came across for the first time this academic year, shared with the change makers. And we were very keen to learn more about University of Kent. Our other guest speaker is a contributor um, to one of the chapters of that same book, Jasmine Sargent, um, who is um, zooming in from Trinidad and Tobago and was a graduate or is a graduate of the University of Kent, was a change maker while they were there, is still a change maker um, where you're currently located, I hear, as a student at the Hugh Wooding Law School. And so Dave and Jasmine are going to be giving us a presentation in a short while. Um, as Cassia said, we're going to first start with some presentations um, about and, and from the LCC changemakers. But before that, we're interested to know, feel free to use the chat or the Padlet. What do people think change making is? What does it entail to make change, especially in relation to issues around racial justice? Be really interested to know. If you have thoughts, feel free to share. Just to say, if you do write, and we do welcome questions and comments to the chat, Padlet, Q&A, um, if you write in particular questions or comments, we're going to come back to these towards the end when we get to the discussion, aren't we, Amita? You're going to help us to, to, to make sure that everyone's um, amazing co comments and questions are, are heard there. Oh, and welcome. We have someone coming in from Mexico and India. This is fantastic. Lots of other Londoners. And Luton, not forgetting Luton. Brilliant. Okay. 
let's hear a little bit about what change making looks like at LCC, London College of Communication in London. Cassie, did you want to tell us a little bit? Yeah, so um, before I pass over to my teammates, I'd like to provide a brief description of what LCC Changemakers do. Uh, next slide, please. So LCC Changemakers are employed by the college to work in partnership with course teams to co-develop decolonial and anti-racist curricula and teaching practices and a student experience that's inclusive, equitable and compassionate. On the whole, the LCC Changemakers were initially employed to work directly with course teams and programmes in a very sort of discipline focused way, acknowledging that change making the curriculum isn't one thing to all, all subjects, but it requires different approaches, different kinds of work according to different disciplines, you know, and at LCC um, is a college of communication, but it's quite different as the practices within the design school as it is to the screen school, you know, reflective of industries and things like that. As I imagine it would be across the University of Kent with the various disciplines you have there. So this event series though is a little bit different. For this event series, we were thinking, it's not so much about looking inwards at our curriculum, but looking outwards at what does it mean to decolonize curriculum of university, regardless of subject you know, of these, these big institutions that have evolved um, for so long and very much have emerged out of various colonial projects. What does that mean across the UK? What does it mean across the world? What does it mean for former British colonies um, and within, yeah, the UK, as we said? So the last time, the, the, or the first event that we had for this particular series looked outwards and across the Pacific to, um, the um, Sao Paulo Senac University in Brazil. We heard some really interesting perspectives and experiences there about how um, students and staff are working together to make change um, around anti-racism and decolonization in the fashion faculty there. Uh, it was a great event and we'll, we can post the YouTube uh, link if you wanna watch the video. And this is a, just a screenshot of, of what that looked like. Um, and Selgado here shown on screen was speaking about all kinds of different things that some of the things we could relate to that sound quite similar to our context here in the UK. Um, you know, if looking at decoloniality in relation to aesthetics, you know, and the way things look and the visual representation and trying to capture and tell stories from minority or underrepresented groups that resonated with what I think we're trying to do. Um, but there were some interesting things that were quite different and to our own co cultural context in Brazil. Some things which, um, Dave, you mentioned in, in, in some of what you've written in the Towards a Decolonizing University book about the very specific context of Brazil and you know, legislation that's been passed there that um, makes sure that quotas are enforced for the recruitment of um, black and indigenous people to certain roles in universities. It's a bit different to <laughs> a kind of the approach of recruitment here in the UK. So it was really interesting sort of um, similarities that were identified um, with this first event that was Sao Paulo, but also some, some contrasts in, in, in the context that were really interesting. And what's emerged over the last couple of months for me is sort of like heading up this initiative, having the, the privilege of, of having that role for the last two years is thinking about the kind of diverse approaches that people take um, in wanting to enact change. Um, and we did an exercise um, back in, was it October? Um, some, yeah, October, between the LCC changemakers and climate advocates, who are another group of students who are employed by the university to, to make change for climate justice. And we did this exercise thinking about our own practices. If we want to change something that's quite you know, serious and has been needing to be changed for a long time. How do we go about it individually? Um, and we, I kind of put across this, this idea of a spectrum from kind of discrete, polite, diplomatic processes of organizational change, <laughs> as you can see on one side there, up to the more sort of radical activist approaches of you know, civil disobedience and protest and holding to account. Um, and looking at these on a spectrum, like where, where would we position the work that we're doing? And I thought that would be a really interesting 
um, theme or focus to present or to offer this evening or this afternoon I should say or this morning for you Jasmine um, to frame our kind of discussions or something for us to think about because I think from what I've learned from my prep discussions with Dave about the work at University of Kent that similarly to LCC the work has involved all aspects of this spectrum you know and individuals have found at different points or at different times there's a need for both the diplomatic discrete processes and the more radical holding to account processes so that's something that I, I felt would be a really interesting thing for us to explore but on that note of activism I want to kind of just come to the book that <laughs> influenced us curating the this this evening's event as we have and inviting Dave and, and Jasmine to speak um, this is the book that I've already mentioned towards decolonizing the university, a kaleidoscope for empowerment, um, with a, a fantastic, powerful front cover there. Let me just, sorry, get on my notes. And yeah, it was co-edited by Dave, um, along with a colleague, um, Jivrav. And I'm really happy to have you here this evening as co contributors to this book and, and being responsible for making this book happen, because it's been so informative for me and the other change makers in helping us to understand what we're doing, what we're trying to do, um, how to do things differently or better moving forward. As I've already mentioned in your introduction, Dave, you kind of speak about racial inequalities in Brazil and Brazilian higher education and give some really great context around that and the actions taken by government and individuals to address that. I really like how you refer to other global examples in South Africa in particular and in the United States um, and, and then bring that back to Kent and, 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 and then Jasmine, your, your chapter is really helpful in, in giving us some insights into the experience of international students here in the UK, you know, and what perspectives they have on something such as decolonizing the curriculum. So we're really looking forward to hearing more about this from you both um, when it comes around to your presentations and our discussions this afternoon. Before I hand over to one of the change makers, just this quote from the preface of the book by Professor Tony Williams really struck me as relevant um, in thinking about the notion of activism and you know the kind of forceful approach that has been required in bringing these persistent inequalities and issues to the attention of the institutions that have that hold responsibility for them perpetuating um, you know and in here she says you know that activists have compelled some universities not only to acknowledge but also to readdress their accumulation of wealth through colonial exploitation exploitation and to revisit decisions about whose lives become venerated in portraits on the walls and statues on the streets and I thought this quote was spot on in helping us to understand that decolonizing the university is not just about reading lists it's not just about our curriculum it's about the fabric of our institutions it's about the statues that the institution is choosing to show or to remove who to as it says here venerate and portray um, and about that acknowledgement of where the wealth is coming from um, and I think that's something also that you, you speak about Dave I know in in in, in your chapter um, it's just absolutely fascinating so yeah it goes deeper than the curriculum um, so although the title of this event is to think about that I think we're going to be quickly moving on from that in our in our discussions um, and I want to hand over to Rachel um, one of the change makers is here with us this, this evening to look at the role of manifestos in this because like the word manifesto we often associate with activism you know about people wanting to put forward a change artists in history have used manifestos to announce a new innovative practice often at times of political turmoil so I think it's really relevant to, to, to have a look into this so I'm going to hand over to you Rachel to tell us what you've learned about manifestos in this context so um, students from the Decolonize the Curriculum project at the University of Kent conducted like a research through um, engagement with students from like various schools uh, around the campus to uh, draft this manifesto. And the manifesto voices um, um, 
the students of color, black, Asian and minority ethnic backgrounds and shows what they want to see changed at the university through the curriculum as well, the institution itself. And one of the main paragraph is race, identity and belonging, promoting inclusion and countering exclusion. And it says it's crucial to support the diverse student population and encourage them to develop confidence and tackle barriers and help seeking behaviors. And the other paragraph is about student voice and co-production with academics. And it said there is a lack of awareness of black scholarship. And because of this, it has posed um, limitation on students of color progressing to uh, postgraduate studies and subsequently into academic positions. Yeah. On the next slide, um, Central Martins chain makers made the manifesto where the main keys are community equity and ecology. For community, Central St. Martins would like to focus more on the student well-being due to uh, the post-COVID transition period. And as a community, it is important to naturalize student-teacher hierarchies and create a safe space for everybody in the building. Um, next is equity, that stands for anti-racism and social justice for all students and staff included. Therefore, it is important to uh, consider different um, cultural, social, economic backgrounds. Last but not least, ecology that asks to limit the negative impact we cause to our planet because of the catastrophic effects of climate change that has been going on for years now. Thank you so much, Rachel. So that's kind of on the on the on the radical activism, you know, making a stand for you know what is believed and, and, and holding the institution to account, isn't it? Very much. Cassia, did you want to talk to us about something a bit more on the other end of the spectrum? Yeah, so um, whilst reading through Kent's publication, an element that caught my attention was chapter five, doing diversity work with students, authored by Dr. Barbara. Barbara Adewome. In this section, Dr. Adewome speaks on continued preference of staging white scholars over marginalized intellects, which unsurprisingly ingrains structured Eurocentric ideologies. It was this observation of Dr. Adewome's students that set in a precedent of remodeling reading lists to mirror the diversity in our contemporary society and education. Kent's diversity mark provides students and staff members with the tools to not only question the colonial structure of their reading list, but to actively change them for the better. The second highlighted paragraph truly embodies the importance of and the real impact of diversifying the reading list suggested to students. Quote, never did I think I would make such an impact on the minds of students by showing and talking positively about BAME groups and referring to BAME authors who look like them. The room becomes more animated as previously quite non-questioning BAME students' eyes widen with enthusiasm, end quote. Next slide, please. In a similar manner to Kent's diversity mark, UIR has been implementing a decolonial reading list toolkit that provides a beneficial checklist of observations and changes to counteract more Eurocentric pedagogy. The commonality of centering colonial perspectives in education doesn't fail one group over another, but all students collectively. This way I think it also aligns perfectly with diversifying full-time and part-time staff, as well as visiting lecturers and guest speakers. Alongside the toolkit, uh, um, what was that? Alongside the toolkit, the UOL published an anti-racism action plan. The objectives, the objectives discussed in the plan is presented on the slide. And the conversation ranges from, but not exclusive to, um, from ex ugh, racial equality, kind of speak, racial equality, inclusivity, and student attainment. In the center of the slide is a screenshot of a course handbook annotation. As LCC changemakers, we work with course teams to do course reapprovals and validations. This consists of team meetings, one to ones, and independent work to examine course reading lists course handbooks, et cetera, in an effort to amend institution, institutional issues. Fabulous, thank you. And finally, um, what we hope to learn today is to firstly understand the dynamic of 
Kent Changemakers and Staff Student Partnership, the progress made in area and areas in need of improvement, the, the need for collaboration between other educational institutions, as well as the similarities and differences between LCC and LCC and Kent Changemakers, as well as an interest in understanding the development of Kent's publication and any further plans of development, as well as audience experiences and interpretations. Brilliant. So, as you can see, Dave and Jasmine, we've taken away a lot from, from what, what, what we've learned already through the book. So it's great to have you here with us to, to, to tell us a bit more and yeah, bring other insights uh, to the table. Uh, so I'll, I'll hand over, to, I think, is it to Jasmine first to speak and then let me know when you want me to, to move on the slide to you, Dave. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning for me still. Um, so I guess just a, well, you've probably heard already, I was an international student at Kent. I'm from Trinidad and Tobago. I'm not here on vacation. Um, so just to sort of give a background of how the manifesto and the project was handled, um, we conducted focus groups. Um, we had maybe about 10 or so focus group leaders, and we engage heavily with different sectors of uh, um, the student population, primarily with um, Black and Asian students and other minority ethnic groups. So the aim of the project would have come down to promoting inclusion and countering exclusion um, focusing on race, identity, and belonging. And I think even as students that were part of the project, that was something very special to us because this happened in my third year of university and it was the first time where I felt, well, I felt a stronger sense of belonging or a strong sense of belonging in the sense of we all became very close, engaging in this week. And why I think that is, is because it was a space that um, Dave and Surya, well, Dr. Surya Jivraj would have created for us to feel safe, to voice our complaints, which we had, but never had a channel to, or never thought we had a channel to voice. So the project and decolonization brings about that, um, sentiment amongst students of color. So <clears throat> throughout all the focus groups that we would have conducted, you did see a frustration in the sense of wanting that identity and sense of belonging and just not being there. And I think that was something special with the project that sort of began to cultivate um, that sort of safe space and leading the university to want to create this and make um, Black and Asian and other minority ethnic groups at un the university feel belonged. So two ways, as would have been outlined before, would have been the curriculum and the system of the institution itself. And that is how the manifesto would have led its guidelines and the research would have been conducted because even though they are two separate elements, they are still very interconnected because they would have they would have accommodated with the curriculum in the classroom, students would have felt a sense of belonging, identity, and safeness. And outside of the classroom, with um, and elements like campus security or even conducting research, etc., that there was still that sense of identity and belonging. So decolonization, um, I remember Dr. Jivraj saying once that it is something radical. And we were talking about radical activism and more, I guess, less radical activism. Um, but the process of decolonization is something very radical. And if we look back, for example, a lot of independent states now, which were former British colonies, their sense of decolonization or let's its independence or becoming republic it was something radical especially at that time because again it was the same process of seeing something where there's a belonging because we were a colony but we're still not getting the attention that we think that we deserve 
that you know we have labor riots going on we have just not the attention given to us but of course you know resources are going back to the mainland to england and it's a bit of exploitation again decolonization is a radical thing so that's why i'm using strong words because you can't really be conservative and want to decolonize so in the sense of creating spaces and the active work of decolonizing, not just creating the space, but actually doing the work. So um, for example, so the second point that we have on screen, which would have been student voice and co-production with academics. I think with the project that was very strong because we saw students having these voices, but someone in authority sort of mirroring these sentiments. And I think that also helped with our, I guess, personal confidence in what we were doing because we're well, yeah, three students, very new. So this sort of work, most of us. And that sort of um, co-working with um, the academics and the staff at Kent really helped in what we could have done and our drive to continue the research, to produce the manifesto, to, you know, be the best for this project, more or less. So with those stakeholders in university and creating that space of race identity belonging was very important. Um, but I think it's also important that institutions that do create these spaces and do have these projects, because a lot of universities are doing such that, it's not only that, okay, we've created it, but implementation is very important because if you just create the space, that's not decolonizing because it is a radical movement. So not only create space, but if you create this in the sense of belonging, it's equally frustrating, if not too important. And more so, a lot of religion spends mission statements approach and international, international approaches to learning and understanding and views and points of views. And I think decolonization is implicit. The sorts of visions and missions that universities seek to create without going through this process. So um, I think that is very important when engaging in decolonizing work. It's not just something to see that it's done, but that it's actually being done with more actions. Thank you, Jasmine. Thank you so much. Some really important points in there, which I'm sure Dave's going to pick up on now. Should we hand over to you, Dave? Thank you. Thank you very much. And Jasmine, I thank you so much um, for, for joining me on this panel. I think it's crucially important. And it's, you know, I, I want to emphasize this publicly and affirm Jasmine and her contribution to this project and all my other colleagues. But I think it's important to center the voices of um, people who would otherwise be um, marginalized and often erased. I think that's always important. So I will start um, my provocation in the manner that I normally do. And that's by giving credit to, to all the people who have done this work before us, before me, all the people who are doing this work now and everyone else who will do this work once I've transitioned and moved on. Um, I want to give credit to everyone in the Decolonized University of Kent team, Dr. Surya Jivraj, um, uh, all the students, uh, I'm not going to remember all the names now, but that's crucially important. All the students who really dedicated their and contributed their time and effort and energy and emotions to this project. Um, so without, without the students, the project wouldn't have happened. So I really, really want to give um, a big shout out to those students. And also, um, I believe, just to kick things off, I, I would echo all the points that Jasmine has made and extend those by saying 
the process of inclusion broadly is a, is a process of collective activism. So it's a collective activism. It's something that we all have to um, understand that we have a stake in, we have an investment. We should be invested in this because the last time I checked, I am absolutely confident that there are more people on this planet that are interested in equality than those who are interested in inequality. So it's a process of collective activism. And so let's look at the, um, the drivers. So with the, the Decolonized University of Kent project, um, if I speak from um, its embryonic stages and speak in terms of a, a structural approach, I think it's important to acknowledge the, um, the state of play, what the state of play was at the time when the project was conceptualized. So concurrently, whilst students were expressing dissatisfaction in the ways in which their students' experiences were being um, experienced and their education was being delivered, there were um, initiatives underway at the University of Kent um, to redress these, some of these inequalities. But as I've written in the book, um, these were moving at a glacial pace. And we know that this happens for whatever reason. These um, initiatives often don't um, move fast enough and don't extend far enough. So we've seen where um, the global attention to racialized inequalities that also um, it, uh, initiated some of these conversations. And um, the conversations around gaps. So that's another interesting one, you know, who is um, experiencing uh, their education less well than who? Who's experiencing their working um, sort of a relationship less well? And we've seen responses from the Higher Education Policy Institute and the Office for Students implementing these performance measures. But amidst all of that, and also the, the quality standards that universities are, are actually reminded that they should be meeting, we still hear calls to decolonize de curricula. And this has been global. So as we've written in the, in the book, um, these are global calls, right? But I want to draw, um, Dr. Neely Fuller Jr. says, um, and it's quite interesting. If you don't understand systemic and institutional racism, and that is the interplay between racism and power, what it is, how it works, then everything else will confuse you. So at that point, you're totally confused. So what we're saying here is important to, to name what you're talking about. And in terms of um, you know, the contribution from students, and Jasmine smokes, spoke excellently about this, Students were actually saying, we can't believe what you say because we're seeing what you're doing, you know, extending the, the James Baldwin quote in Tina Turner, right? And so it's essential to see clearly and think clearly and ask the innocent first question, what is colonization? And if we can't ask that, those questions, then we probably won't agree as to what decolonization is. And so, I think drawing on Eve Tuck and Wayne Yang's definition of um, decolonization and speaking about decolonization um, as not a metaphor, what was important for the collective was to establish the differentiation between decolonization, the noun, and the process of decolonizing, which is the verb, right? So exploring the landscape at the university, thinking about what is actually happening, thinking about the, the effect that it is happening on students and Jasmine spoke about how it felt, how does it feel? So that aligns with inclusion and exclusion. How does it feel here in my institution? And I think what became apparent was that there, there were less overt forms of exclusion at play. So microaggressions was a big thing. And these were less identifiable, things that you just couldn't put your finger on. You know, things like um, Professor Shirley Ann Tate speaks about this. You can't put your finger on it. You know, you might mention this to someone and they might say, Dave, you're too sensitive. You know, or an international student might be wondering what is going on here? You know, we're not used to these sort of things, right? These sort of behaviors. Um, so in collaboration with my colleague, um, Dr. Soraya Jivraj, we decided that we 
were going to um, embark on this process along with students to illuminate some of these inequalities because that was crucially important to illuminate the inequalities for transformation. So really to illuminate the inequalities to ensure that we build and develop and sustain an inclusive ecosystem where all students and staff can feel that they can bring their whole and authentic selves if they choose to, feeling a sense of belonging. So that was important. And crucially, this had already happened at the University of Kent, albeit in a very, very um, uh, menial way back in the 70s with a, 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 a module. So this wasn't new and we see this in history, you know, history as a, as a way of repeating itself. So we've seen that. The intention, I will say though, and, um, and Gugi Wethongo speaks about that, about crushing hierarchy, redistributing power, thinking about the extent to which cultures can breathe life into each other. And it wasn't necessarily to condemn any form of uh, epistemology, any form of culture to the dustbin. It was about developing that ecosystem where we could all co-create knowledge, where we could all feel a sense of belonging. And so when we think about it, I think the idea of whiteness or the concept of whiteness became very apparent. And it was crucial to make that distinction between white as a racially mind, right, racialized category and whiteness as the structure. So the in in interventions were aimed at redressing the structural inequalities, which would then, as you know, we believed, would then serve to develop that culture, which could then affect the interpersonal uh, interactions on the ground. So I think, again, crucially, another thing was to ensure that we archive this material, so recorded, hence the reason why the book was, was uh, constructed in collaboration with the students, um, to ensure that we record these, because what we see quite often is people do the work and there's some good practice happening across the sector. We see this across the UK sector. Globally, there's really good practice. But recording these practices and learning from practices in different geographical areas, that can prove quite challenging. Less so when we started, but um, more so I think um, colleagues are documenting their, their endeavors. So that is really, really important. And so if we move to the manifesto in itself, I believe that was a game changing moment at the University of Kent. And um, the offshoot of that has seen the university developing um, various strategies to promote equality. For example, their um, anti-racism strategy. You know, we've seen those. So the effort wasn't lost um, in making those, those really, really important contributions, having those, co the, those conversations, having those micro conversations, and so what I would um, encourage colleagues to do here though, first of all, is to really, really think about what is it that you're trying to do and what are the limits and proportions of what you can do? Because as we know, true decolonization would warrant um, a deconstruction and a reconstruction on more fertile soil. Uh, Professor Karen Salt speaks about the extent to which toxic soil produces toxic fruit. So healthy fruit won't grow in toxic soil. So thinking carefully about what is it that you are intending to do? We see um, in some settings, uh, diversify, diversifying the curriculum is conflated with internationalization, also conflating with inclusion agendas. So really, really getting to the, the heart of it. What is it that you're trying to do? Who are your allies? Who are your allies? I think that is important really to understand who else should be invested in this and how do you operate? How do you transmit this message that the endeavor is a collective endeavor, an endeavor of collective activism? And activism, as you know, 
quite, quite often is said, it's not a one lane highway. So we don't have to do it the same way. What is important here is to address the, the crucial first question, what is it that we're trying to do and how can we do this? So I will end this here and invite questions because I think um, it, it works better if we leave more time for colleagues to interact. But I'll end with a, a nice quote that I like. And I think it probably speaks to, um, to the extent to which you know, we can have this call to action. So here we go. We must make a choice today. It is in our hands, our people, our planet need it more than ever. We can work with those who are ready to go because the train is ready to leave. And those who are not yet ready, we need to continue to encircle them and remind them that their people, not our people, but their people need them to get on board as soon as possible. So that is a quote from the Right Honorable Mia Motley, the, um, the then Prime Minister of Barbados. So this is not a problem for racially minoritized people. It's not their problem. It's our problem, it's everybody's problem. So as uh, Mia Motley said, get on board as soon as possible. And we will keep encircling you and keep reminding you, it's not our people, but your people that need you to get on board. So I'll leave it here. Thank you so much, everyone. What, what I mean is just so rich. Uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, equally to Lucy, Cassia and Rachel from LCC and Jasmine and Dave from Kent, thank you. Um, really just really thought provoking and so reflective. Uh, it, it was great to hear. Um, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I, it'd be great to have questions. I've got a couple of questions which I can kick start with. Uh, I, can, I should also quickly just introduce myself. I work with Lucy um, uh, at LCC and widely UAL as well. Um, I, I work especially on how we can collaborate with students more in terms of um, encouraging decolonial practice and social justice, not just in the curriculum, but more generally in the university environment and pedagogy. Um, my background is in dance studies, where I study in my uh, PhD, I did, uh, I looked at sort of feminist and post-colonial, uh, uh, put a feminist and post-colonial lens into dance studies and dance on dance in film and on stage. Um, yeah, so that's me. Um, questions basically are welcome for everyone. So you can ask questions to the whole panel or specifically to certain people. I wouldn't mind asking a question, which is that, Dave brought up the question of awarding gaps and of course the whole sort of you know the, the decolonial movement if I can call it that in universities uh, often gets kind of linked with the question of awarding gaps if, whether it should or not that's a separate question uh, but one of the things that students often say um, it, about awarding gaps or about the decolonial uh, decolonial aims and goals is that one of the very important things that they think perhaps there should be more of in universities and isn't enough of at the moment is conversations about race. Uh, so safe spaces where people can talk about race. Now this seems really extremely important because of course, a lot of the people that are currently employed in universities and some people that study at universities might not have a direct experience of racism. So we kind of have to understand it from those who do. Uh, and those who do have an experience of it don't always feel that this, you know, they don't, we don't necessarily want to be othered or to be that person who's always talking about race. Uh, so how, you know, I, I would, wouldn't mind knowing from both LCC and Kent, uh, you know, what, what can we do about that? What, how can we create those conversations about race? Uh, you know, any, any experiences that you have of doing that would be, Great to hear. I think I'll give this a go. Um, as you spoke, Professor Darrell Wing Su came to mind and he speaks about um, race talk. Um, so the, that's the extent to which conversations around race and racism and racialization touches hot buttons in everyone. It touches hot buttons in everyone, right? Even more so in people who are racially minoritized because it's their lived experiences, right? Every day you have to live this thing. 
So it touches hot buttons. So it hot buttons comes with emotions. But one of the things I often wonder is if you are using the remote control and let's say you, I don't know, you wanted to watch a netball game, right? And the remote control broke five minutes before the game started. I think in this day and age, we probably could all agree that everyone would probably YouTube, let's figure out how we can fix this remote control, right? Let's YouTube it quickly and we fixed it. So coming back to your question, I understand the hesitation and um, a lot of the apprehension in speaking about matters relating to racial inequality, because you know people are probably afraid to say something wrong. But the first thing I would say is similar to the way how I would YouTube how to fix my remote control. I think I probably need to YouTube how to have these conversations. What is it about this that make people feel a bit uncomfortable? So basically doing my homework, right? And then the next thing is Gordon Alport speaks about this in his 1954 paper, contact theory. So what I would do, I would deliberately ensure that I make contact with people who are not like me. I want to seek out those contacts intentionally because I can't understand the lived experiences. One, if I don't go and do my homework to have a working knowledge, then two, make contact so I can actually engage in these conversations. And then the third thing I would say is be mindful of the emotional labor that comes with it. Dave, it's your problem. This is what's gonna happen. You can go away and fix it. We'll probably even give you the time and, the, and, and a budget to fix it, but you fix it. And when it's fixed, you tell me and I'll send out a blog about it. The problem is our problem is for everyone. So what I'm saying here is the emotional labor, we need to think about that and rightfully so. Um, you know, you, you mentioned hearing the voices. So this is the, the, the standpoint theory, right? The people who experience the racialized inequality on a daily basis, of course, they have a firm knowledge of these levels of inequality. So they are actually best placed to, you know, to tell you how it feels, right? But what I'm saying here is about healing requires recognition. So it's about recognizing the harm that has been done. There's an element of reparation that needs to happen. Like, what do we do about it? How do we ensure that we create spaces? And there's an element of self-learning and development that needs to happen. So I think in a nutshell, you know, I think that probably encapsulates some of the actions because you can't truly, really, really understand somebody's experience but what you can do you can empathize you can educate yourself you can acknowledge the hurt the harm you can do these things and these things we can be doing you know they're always great matters relating to race as i've written are always spoken about in hushed tones we don't want to disturb anyone we don't you know let's whisper about it but why can't we just have the conversation you know because it's about inclusion transforming the spaces, disrupting the status quo for transformation. So it's about being uncomfortable. If you're comfortable, it means that you're definitely not doing it right. You have to be uncomfortable. So I'll leave it there and allow um, colleagues to share their thoughts. Jasmine. Hi, I just wanted to add to what Dave said, um, but in terms of conversations about race, um, I think it's important if to create this space that it is known that these conversations aren't happening just for talking sake, that these conversations are happening so that um, there's can be insight into how persons feel about being racialized and how that impacts their lives um, at the university and be used to stimulate change. Because I think any form of activism overall it's in vain if it's just coming together and talking um so and i think even with the project what made persons i guess more inclined to give contributions is that you know we were drafting the manifesto we were carrying this back to the institution it wasn't just conversations about what's happening to them but conversations that can lead to change or should lead to change 
So I think making that known or creating spaces where that can be done is very important to stimulate the conversation around race. Great, thank you. Um, any, anyone else want to jump into that one? Otherwise, I'll, I'll um, ask you another one. Yeah, if I can. Um, oh, yeah, so powerful and resonating on so many levels with what you've been saying. And it's so good to be, to have a, asserted in what you're saying, what's really core, you know, from when you started speaking about belonging so much, that's what I really got from when you both started speaking today, Jasmine and Dave, about what does it mean to feel belonging and, and, and included in a place and to be yourself. And then towards what you've just been saying there about the importance of being recognized and then that leading to some action, you know, and it, I kind of had that in my head of recognition and action, if that could be in the form of reparations and, it's just so important and it it got me thinking actually it reminded me of the framework um of shades of noir which is um a, a ual um knowledge exchange center um set up by aisha richards um a long time ago and their framework um has five five r words <laughs> in a similar vein you know the importance of representation of renumeration of reparation reclamation and redistribution which are words that you if not mentioned today or you know alluded to as part of what we're speaking about there um, and you can find that on their about page on, on shades of Mars. So i just wanted to mention those because i think they're sometimes not paid attention to enough in a lot of the decolonial discourse in the university you know, um, at all and you know, are we really doing anything if we're not paying attention to reparation remuneration reclamation and redistribution <laughs> we're just concentrating on representation when we're adjusting a reading list yeah mm. that's great thank you thanks for bringing that in and yes uh, both you and jasmine kind of pointed out that importance of activism not just conversations, not just like you said, Lucy, changing the reading list, but going beyond that. Uh, I've, I've found it's interesting because when you uh, just like Dave was saying earlier that when the, you know, it's such a trigger word sometimes for conversations about race, you know, because race can be quite a sensitive and touchy topic and like a hot button uh, using Dave's words. Um, it's interesting because there are times where we've opened a conversation about otherness. Uh, and which isn't a particularly specifically about race, but can be all kinds of otherness. And then you can see loads of people want to talk about it because lots of people have experienced feeling othered. Um, and then it inevitably leads to conversations about race. But for some reason that, that when you introduce the topic as conversations about race, it might, it, it sometimes becomes much more of a hot button. Okay, so uh, moving on to a slightly different question. And it's funny because, um, so Chris from the audience has a question and I, um, I, can, I can say it for you, Chris, but also do feel free to jump in and just, uh, you know, if you want to say more, please do. And it's resonating because I, I was thinking of something along those lines as well. And I, similarly to you, Chris, was thinking, oh, is that a bit too <laughs> out of the way of what the conversation is doing at the moment? So Chris has asked, you know, given that the dominant colonial powers like governments and businesses control the learning technologies that universities and more generally education use, can we decolonize these these learning, these digital learning spaces and environments. So that's Chris's question. And funnily enough, you know, uh, Chris is linking education to larger agendas of governments and businesses. And I think that is so crucial because my head was going there too. You know, as long as industry and governments are interested in profit, I was thinking along the lines of, you know, the climate crisis. So for example, which banks we, we invest in is actually really important because banks invest in fossil fuels. Uh, so I was thinking along those lines, you know, as long as industry is interested in profit uh, and they are the ones controlling, you know, similar to what Chris said, perhaps learning technologies, learning environments, uh, or just the systems in which we live, you know, how can we create that change? So yeah, any, any thoughts on that would be great. And Chris, if you want to join, you know, if you want to say anything more about your question, please do. Yeah, I, I, as you spoke, I'm thinking about um, 
Dr. Ahmed Memon, um, Joy Olubuega, and Francesca, Dr. Francesca Sabande, they, they wrote a chapter in the book, Podcast as Powerful Pedagogy. And I'm thinking about that in response to your question, because I, I believe that um, considering the, um, the ways in which universities are regulated, we can't, um, we can't ignore that, right? For the purposes of this exercise. But what we can do is think about um, our locus of control. So what is it we can control? And thinking about, you know, as um, Professor Sir Jeff Palmer says, system consciousness, the extent to which you can operate within a system, right? So that chapter, podcast as powerful pedagogy, what that is really saying is that we have these technologies here and we can use them in dynamic ways to promote epistemic justice. We can use them in dynamic ways to promote epistemic justice. And we see that, you know, we young people, younger people nowadays, they're always online, right? But online doing what? You understand? So is it possible for us then to introduce a new pedagogy by using those um, digital mediums? You know, we see blended learning has now been, become normalized in our provisions in higher education as a result of the pandemic and ways in which we had to um, uh, adjust the way we deliver education. So we can do that. What we're saying here is, the disruption of the traditional ways of using these technologies might be something that we need to consider and think about what does success look like? I always start from that position, you know, what does success look like? How will we know when we've arrived, when we've, when we've um, gained the success? How, you know, academics in the room, evaluation, what are we evaluating this thing against, right? And, and I know I'm answering questions with questions, but, I think that's important. And when, when, what's the timeline? You know, this could be an incremental improvement. It doesn't have to happen tomorrow morning, everything, because the reality is, I don't think it will, but redressing power imbalances is like a period of mourning, it's grief. It comes with a, with a loss because people who have power really don't relinquish it very easily. That unearned privilege and those unearned levels of power. So it's about recognizing marginal gains, understanding what success looks like and redefining that as we go along, I think. But we can definitely be more um, innovative and more dynamic in the ways in which we use the digital learning spaces as outlined in the book. Um, I can shortly add to that. Are you all hearing me saying my connection is unstable? Okay, good. Um, so I think that any form of activism, like we've been talking, is going to be a battle, unfortunately. Um, especially as in the question it stated, you know, governments and businesses and very powerful people um, control mechanisms of learning. Um, but I do think that collective action is very important. And I think digital spaces like this, where I can come from Trinidad and give my point of view and perspectives can be magnified through that. Um, I think that is a good way of using that digital space for our advantage. And the more people we have understanding what the work is, what decolonization is and how it can be and what it should look like although we don't know what it's going to look like. But um, I think that is very important because collective action works. I know um, there's a group at Kendi Afro Diasporic Legal Network. And I always remember when I said that, that's a quote directly from them. Collective action works because coming together and having these conversations and people learning from other people is a way of more people getting on board to the movement so to speak um so yeah I, I could come in on that as you've both been speaking i've been thinking and re-looking at your uh, chris's question actually and thinking about a, a different view of i think how i've seen digitization 
and what it's offered in terms of democratizing, of opening up, of enabling collective action and voice, as opposed to its limitations. Um, and then as you've both been speaking, I've been thinking, hmm, but are they the, um, the, uh, the, the, the platforms that the university say that we're allowed to use, <laughs> like the ones that have been purchased with license, or are they the platforms, the ones I'm thinking of that are out there and kind of publicly accessible that universities tend to be cautious about? Um, and as I'm reflecting, like actually it is more the latter. Like I think the platforms that have really enabled the work as I've seen it at University of the Arts London over recent years has been Twitter, um, and Instagram for making platforms for students to collectivize the, the, the voice that they felt has not been heard when it comes to issues of racial harassment um, within the conventional platforms inside the university. Um, and it's when those movements um, have really taken hold and got a good following that the university has responded with emboldened actions and more resource behind that. I think without those two movements, of it was called UAL So White and then um, UAL Truths. Without those movements, I'm not sure if you know the university would have doubled their action, and they are not permitted platforms. <laughs> and then I also think another piece I've been doing of work I've been doing outside of Changemakers, but with Changemakers in early days has been looking at Wikipedia as a platform for enabling us to, you know. Uh, represent ourselves and our own stories because it is open source technology that we can edit you know and, and historically those that are, that are marginalized and reading lists is because they've been marginalized from the publishing world you know they don't get published they don't get peer reviewed women people of color people in the in the global south you know and there's still a dominant over representation of of, of, of white men in in our reading list because the work isn't out there published you know, so the importance of open source platforms um, is, is massive for being able to represent yourselves. But then the university doesn't always take very seriously those platforms and will warn students, you know, about how unreliable they are, further perpetuating those kind of hierarchies. And so I think it's a really interesting question, Chris, not um, left field at all, but I think actually an urgent one, where, as colleagues have said here, we, we, we were forced in through the pandemic to move so dramatically into a new virtual digital realm, which I think has provided as many opportunities as, as it has, like today, as you said, Jasmine, you're zooming in from across the ocean, and that's fantastic on a different time zone, as many opportunities as it has new challenges and things to be wary of <laughs> yeah thanks for all the reminders uh, uh, both of the kind of the democratizing potential of technology as well as what jasmine said about collective action you know and, and that's really needed i always worry you know th th there are things about universities other than the kind of the learning technologies that worry me for example the kind of the drive to double the number of students in the next 10 years or whatever and you always think well that's about profit and that's not necessarily about the quality of education that we're offering or or can it you know can we can we make it about that um so it, it, it's always a little bit um you know, it's always a little bit worrying when that kind of profit or the business mentality kind of comes into it. Um, okay, so uh, do keep the questions coming, please. Uh, I have another question for everyone, and I'd, I'd love it if um, Cassie and Rachel wanted to respond to this as well as um, Jasmine, Dave, and Lucy. So uh, I, I'm again going to take uh, steel. A, um, a term that Dave used earlier about a slightly different thing. Uh, Kira, please do ask a question and I'm just gonna put my question into the mix and then please do uh, put it in uh, into the chat or uh, we'll, come, we'll come to you immediately after this one. Uh, so you used the term emotional labor and I would love it if there was some reflection on, um, you know, the emotional labor of being a change maker. Uh, you know, what is that like when you're trying to do this work? Um, so yeah, I'd, I'm just going to leave it at that. I'm not even going to elaborate. Um, just the emotional labor of being a change maker. Uh, I can speak a little bit on this. Um, I would I would say that in terms of emotional labor, it differs for me with 
like week by week because the workload always changes for me it's never consistent some weeks I don't have too much some weeks I'm like surrounded by paperwork and things to read and I think it's about finding a way to kind of like balance it out and kind of knowing your limitations and putting those boundaries first and not overworking those boundaries uh, what I do like is the fact that when we started we had like a, a four hour work limit and I would work for four hours a week and then I would never go beyond that because I knew for myself personally it was just four hours was more than enough to be focused on the same topic so that is so like deep and so strong um and even nowadays even though I'm working a few more hours than usual I always make sure that it doesn't come I don't, I don't get to a point where I'm completely exhausted when it like mentally as well because I feel like it's definitely important that we are completely and 100 percent active and aware of what we're doing at all times I feel like it'll be a disservice to our to this like to this ideology and thinking and practice to allow ourselves to kind of fall short of what we're trying to do but emotional labor is definitely an issue a lot of us will face and have faced but I think it is worth it in the end but all, but it's definitely better to work from a set boundaries and kind of let everyone know that you're working with that that's your boundaries and you will not cross that and there's nothing that will make you cross that boundary Brilliant, thank you. Mm, the boundaries question is so, so important not to let it completely rule your life, right? There's other things to think about as well. Brilliant. Anyone else want to jump into that one? I can, I can speak on that in a slightly different way about a boundary and a kind of flexibility with when and how to draw upon your own lived experience as someone having been racialized or um, encountered, yeah, racial incidents. And I speak about this on a personal level that I kind of, I've kind of used it. It can be really powerful to bring that into situations um, to help develop understanding and to persuade and to confirm or convince where people feel like they need persuading. But there are other times when it just does not feel safe to do that or I do not feel on that particular day, emotionally strong or safe enough to, to be able to share in that way and I won't. So it's a kind of powerful tool, but I think in the same way that I think Cassie, you've been saying you know, about it, how important it is to protect your time because it can be really burdensome and, and hard, really hard work. And um, it's also, yeah, picking and choosing when and how you might operate to, to protect yourself and, 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 and safety and interests. I think that's been a really important learning point for me. Yeah, I, I think this speaks to the um, importance of allyship, you know, here, um, having these sponsors, having people to around you who are invested in this endeavor to share the load because emotional labor as with anything else is, is a real, real reality. Um, and so looking after yourself really is important. Um, I think the issue here is because people who are racially minoritized, that's their daily lived experience. You know, they can't um, for some reason just walk out tomorrow and be of a different skin tone. They can't do that, just for example. So it comes with a territory. So. What I would say is, and this is probably a message more so to allies, is to recognize that and really act in support of you know, people who, who can't actually relinquish their racialized status that has been imposed on them. But really finding avenues to, and, and networks as well. So Jasmine spoke about the extent to which um, being a member of the decolonized University of Kent um, group sort of promoted that shared um, community, you know, that sense of uh, um, that real sense of belonging in a community of practice. So, you know, I'm suggesting here is that finding communities of practice, sharing experiences, collaborating with colleagues, and ensuring that really, really thinking about well-being, definitely thinking about your well-being, because this is emotional. Um, it's really hard going and it will affect you. The boundaries as well, 
um, one, one of colleagues here spoke about boundaries, establishing boundaries. I've seen too many people be hurt by these, even the conversations on a daily basis. So really, really just looking after yourselves and checking in on each other. This is something that uh, unfortunately, um, we're just getting back to face-to-face -face conferences, but conference was normally a place where we would check in on each other as practitioners. You know, it's sort of like a, 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 a real um, big, big get together. How are you doing? How's it going in your place? That's important, you know, connecting with people. And it's probably a little bit easier now because we have, again, digital environment that we can use, but really ensuring that we, we look after ourselves. I think that's crucial. Great, thank you. Uh, well-being and boundaries uh, for all of us to remember. That's really important. A um, couple of questions. Okay, so Chiara, do you want to? Um, okay, Chiara, uh, Chiara, do you want to type it? If the mic isn't working. Yeah, just to say, and I should have said at the start, the, the Zoom setup we have today anticipating huge audience today was um so that all the audience have their mics automatically turned off and i can't turn them back on so unless it can get turned back uh, on uh, mine is turned on i believe um, oh brilliant you... okay go for it <laughs> yeah um i just want to say like this conversation has been really insightful and just like really useful for me as someone who's obviously navigating the university and um for the first two years now and I know Lucy, you um, actually taught a you taught my class um, in a lecture about decolonizing Wikipedia. Um, as I'm on fashion history and theory uh, right now, and I think it's interesting when you get what feels like conflicting messages um, between different members of staff and different bodies within the university's intentions. Because I think, on the one hand, you know you have a lot of um, media saying you know that universities are supporting diversity and um supporting inclusion and all these things but then i've only had i think three black lecturers um in two years at uni and they've only been for singular lectures not like across the board um which is just one you know observation i've had um and another is when navigating the uni i've i've definitely noticed more the sense of othering um, that I felt the less that I've um, actively been code switching and I think that really does go to show um, just the extent to like um, how isolation can, can really happen in certain spaces and you know it's like on the one hand you know you're always told you know fashion's tough and you're never going to get on with everyone but on the other hand you have to remember like Yes, not, not everything is about race, but when as the only person of color, you're completely othered, you have to wonder if it is about race. And like, that's something that gets really difficult to, to talk about. And in my role as a change maker, I found a really diverse and beautiful group of people who like made me feel very welcome and very comfortable. But, you know, and the points being made earlier were correct. Like it can be very emotionally taxing, you know, having to sometimes relive and, and tell accounts of difficult encounters and experiences. So while on the one hand, I'm, I'm incredibly grateful for my job and I really enjoyed writing the manifesto and, and like participating in, in, in change maker scheme. I've also been like, it's, it's been tiring, you know, it's been really hard. Um, being an activist is not easy and having these conversations is not easy, but I think that's what makes it feel um, so worthwhile. I just wanted to kind of like share that uh, with you and, and ask if anyone had any comments on that? Uh, that is so brave. So, so thank you so much for sharing that because you know that's that's really personal. Thank you. That's great. Thank you so much um, for that and for sharing your experience um, as well. Um, anyone, if anyone wants to uh, say anything more, please do. There is another question uh, from, I, I hope I'm saying your name right, but do correct me, Yashika. Um, the question, I think, you know, I, I think it is a broader question as well that, than uh, the way that Yashika has framed it, which is about sort of decolonizing schools. Uh, Yashika has framed that in the arts education sense, you know, how, how it's since what, what Yashika is saying is that uh, art and design aren't valued as much 
in uh, in secondary schools and then uh, you know so that that means that there are students perhaps being funneled into careers that uh, then you know their natural inclination might be towards the arts but they're being funneled into other careers but I want to broaden that generally as well because again one of my sort of always qualms is that we we worry about awarding gaps and kind of decolonizing universities uh, obviously this is our job to do uh, but at the same time we are we, we get students when they're 18 or older um, and by that time they've gone through an education system already for uh, for you know uh, 15 years or more where uh, which isn't decolonized or is, is not perhaps you know thinking enough about the question of social justice uh, I'm starting to maybe, but maybe maybe not doing it enough. Um, so you know, what do we do with that? You know, it, it's part of the system and it's part of the fabric uh, in which students have already been educated. So uh, you know, how can we? I, I don't know. How can we? How can we work with this problem? What can we do about it? Um, I can give an input. Um, so, well, obviously, not go to secondary school in the UK, but something. I think that, yes, the education system can be decolonized, but the powers that we have to want to decolonize it. So just to kind of juxtapose my secondary student education in the Caribbean, we have our own, obviously, curriculum, syllabus, et cetera. And we learn about things like slavery, indentureship, colonialism, et cetera. When I would interact with um, students, well, people from the UK when I was at university, they didn't learn about those things. Or if they did, it was a passing by. And to me, that was alarming because I was like, this is as much of your history as it is of my history. And in the sense of also not teaching, only teaching the demeaning aspects of Black and Asian history, if they do and not the uplifting aspects. And that's also part of things that should be done at the secondary school level, because those are very important years in um, someone's development and their confidence and self-esteem. And coming to the question of art and design, um, my secondary school was one of the very few that had, um, you know, a sort of art syllabus that was like, it was well, it's a, it's a school well known for art, basically, amongst other things. So the thing is that you have, we have to not only decolonize the education system, but also unlearn the students who go into that same passion. Um, or drive too, because that in itself is detrimental to their development. So I think decolonizing the education system, you have to engage in this work and understand what decolonization is and how important it is for the development of children, teenagers for a country because, I mean, we're the future. So, um, Unfortunately, although I think that is also a pill battle, is a battle that deserves to be fought and it can happen. It, we just have to keep pushing that agenda. Yeah, yeah I think it's spot on, Jasmine. I, I, I often think about, um, uh, is it Chino Achebe that speaks about this, decolonizing the mind, you know, the extent to which it could start there, right? The physical space is the physical space, but what about the way, the cognitive space, the ways in which we conceptualize the world, right? And that might trigger some form of interest, you know, for us to actually engage with scholarship from different geographical areas, um, from people with different identities, redressing this idea of, or dismantling this idea of knowers and know, known and knowers, who's authorized to know. Um, I mean, I, I was born in Jamaica, right? Grew up in the Caribbean. So that's one of my privileges, I might add. I have the benefit of, of a, a dual perspective. You know, I grew up learning about, um, you know, people who really, you know, people like Stuart Hall, you learned about these people, right? You learned broadly 
but then a lot of it was colonial, but I could still see beyond the immediacy. And so sometimes I worry that in this day and age, people are still trapped in these little boxes because of the, the colonization of the mind. They can't imagine what it, what it should, what it is like to, to read something from Ana Malfitano in Brazil, right? They can't imagine what it is like to read um, books from people in sub-Saharan Africa, anywhere. You know, we grew up, our literature curriculum was um, these things fall apart. That's something that we were reading years ago in the Caribbean. And so I think really sending that message home, you know, what can we do then? Okay, what, Dave, what can you do? You can't dismantle the physical structure. That's outside of your local subcontrol. But what you can do is decolonize your mind. You actually can control that. You can do that. Does that represent success? I think so. Marginal gains might be, but I think it does represent some form of success. And so I, I would introduce that as well, you know, the extent to which we can act within the locus of our control as, you know, introducing another element to the whole like, decolonization um, endeavor. That's so interesting. I'm just thinking of imagining a time when Achieve's Things Fall Apart might be on the compulsory re reading list of a UK course. <laughs> Wondering how far away we are from that. Because I think as you observed, Jasmine and Chiara, you've said it in the comments that you've seen it as well. You know, the, the, the stark difference between what's taught on the British curriculum about British colonial history and what's taught in other countries. <laughs> um, uh, is is so stark and you you don't know what you don't know like what you're saying Dave you don't know what's out there you don't know what to look for if you don't know it exists you don't know how to approach these texts if you don't have any foundations for understanding anything outside of a quite narrow set of of, of literature and I think that's what's been um you know purposefully maintained um in in the UK to to keep people from resisting and, and and upsetting and changing a power balance which kind of brings me full circle back to that spectrum and thinking about the need for radicalization and or radical action sorry and how as you were both saying you know decolonization is default a radical act because it upsets and, and changes um totally um that that dynamic um completely yes yeah, it's, it's so great to hear the perspectives that you've brought to this today on that. Lu Lucy, I'm, I'm thinking here, like underscoring the, you know, the, the importance of establishing what, what is education for? What is higher education for? So we saw that in the Robbins report, what, what was that, 1963? Mm -hmm. You know, what is higher education for? Is it to create people who can play a role in society to contribute to the development of the economy? add to the labor force is that what it is or is it for the pure pursuit of knowledge mm. and so just thinking about university a university experience and the ways in which um, universities are regulated in terms of quality and curricula it aligns with you know the idea of what education is for right um, and i'm thinking that there, there <laughs> the knowledge systems is a sea of wide open open ocean is endless right and I think there's a real real opportunity here in 2022 and beyond for us to engage with different knowledge systems beyond what is instituted in the canon right um, so we can do that there's nothing stopping um, Jasmine from lending me a book you know a book that was written by someone in uh, in New Zealand or somewhere like that. There's nothing stopping that. There's nothing stopping Jasmine from sending me a link. And we saw that in the with, amongst the the colleagues in the decolonized University of Kent movement, sharing resources, introducing new scholarship. People are thinking like, "Wow, I'm reading this. I didn't know this. I learned so much." Right? My reading list grew like so because you know students would bring this thing, this book, and it, and it just snowballs. There's nothing stopping anyone from doing that. Obviously, our educators have a responsibility to provide a culturally sensitive curriculum. 
But what I'm suggesting here is that, you know, we also have an, a responsibility to ensure that we are engaging with these, these elements of curricula and signposting and demanding that our educators bring these mm -hmm. to other students. So again, it's, you know, this idea of collective, collective activism, it, you know, I, I don't think we can shy away from that one. I think probably that's the, 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 the main theme that's come out of all of these discussions. Thank you. Thank you all. And thank you for the questions. I'm going to hand this back to Lucy now. Um, to, to, we've only got a few minutes left. Thank you, Amita, and, and thank you, everyone. I think just on that, that, that broader question, Dave, of what is education for, as you were speaking, I was also reminded of Paulo Freire, the um, critical pedagogue in Brazil, who says something like, you know, is it for indoctrination or transformation? Um, and I think about my own experience going to art college where I didn't come out knowing how to paint by numbers, how to weld a sculptor very well. But I came out thinking very critically and with a kind of spirit of wanting to challenge. That's what art college did to me. And, and they may be useless skills in an economy that wanted me to come out with something useful for industry, but they're useful skills, I think, in supporting others to think critically. Um, but that's dangerous. They're dangerous tools to have, you know, if, the, if the, the, the context doesn't want you to think like that. So, yeah, only a few minutes to go. I wasn't sure if we'd fill this discussion space, but I think we could carry on for a lot longer. I'm so happy to have met you, Jasmine and Dave, today. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation and joining us for this discussion. Thank you so much, Rachel and Cassia for speaking to your experience and what you've learned today um, from our colleagues at Kent. And thank you, Amita, for hosting our um, discussion. Um, and thank you for those of you, Kiara, Chris, and everyone else in the audience who have contributed to um, questions and comments, Yashika, here today. Um, this is being recorded. The recording should appear on YouTube in probably the next month. It takes a while to get it subtitled and up online. The Padlet will remain open if you want to post any feedback or comments um, after we finished here today. Um, I think that yeah, just leaves me to say goodbye and have a lovely afternoon. Take care. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Bye. Have a good day, everybody. Take care, Thanks, Jasmine. everyone. Good to meet you. Take care. Take care. Bye.